Welcome everyone. I'm Angie Garber with the Marketing Department here at Avizacon. For those of you who are new to Avizacon's webinar series, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about us. Our mission is to boost your project management efficiencies by optimizing your processes and technologies, creating measurable results that empower you and your organization. Advisacon has over 20 years in the project management industry and is a gold level partner with Microsoft. No matter your company size, our team specializes in maximizing your business and personal productivity by leveraging the Microsoft technology experience. For those of you who join us on a weekly basis, you know that today's session is part of our weekly series we refer to as Webinar Wednesday. Each week the topic is different and designed to give you helpful information that will have a direct impact on your day-to-day -day tasks. Today's webinar session will be a half hour in length, which means it also qualifies for half a PDU. I will give you more information about that at the end of our time together. If you have any questions or need clarification during our time together, please utilize the question section of the control panel. We'll do our best to address them during our session, but if we aren't able to, please know that we will reach out shortly afterwards with the answer. It is now my pleasure to welcome today's presenter, Advisacon's President and Founder and Microsoft MVP, Mr. Tim Runcie. Tim? Thanks, Angie. Welcome, everyone, to Webinar Wednesday. Uh, this is a fun topic to uh, be discussing, especially since I've uh, returned from the Microsoft uh, headquarters for about a week working with the engineering team, and Agile was absolutely front and center in many, many of our conversations. So uh, today's session, today we're going to go through a couple things. One, I want to take uh, a little bit of a step back, talk about the Agile big picture, talk about what's coming at a very high level, and then I'm going to roll into some approaches that you will not only be able to use today, but also in the future going forward with kind of that Agile, Agile environment. So just a little bit of the backstory. If uh, you haven't uh, seen kind of the process of it, there's about 30 million people using uh, project. And whether it's desktop or it's enterprise or it's server or it's online, there's a lot of different options that are available. And there's a consistent march forward to help organizations begin to take a look at what's happening. So from the 2016-2013 forward, um, there's been a, a shift in changing accessibility reports, visibility, and also how we're able to work with information. So from a technology perspective, especially thinking around Agile, Microsoft recognizes that there's really three tiers in how objects work, right? So we talk about whether we're doing project, portfolio management, strategic planning, doing high-level demand management and resource capacity planning. That clearly sits right inside of the project portfolio space where Microsoft Project is. The new licensing model that came out uh, as of August 1st of 2016 uh, Microsoft said, hey, look, if you buy Microsoft Project Desktop uh, tool, you also get the enterprise version as well with the same licensing. So they really kind of begin moving the obstacles where uh, people are working in the desktop version and creating master projects in a local resource. They're really beginning to centralize and then make it accessible the different elements to work with. Now, if we talk about something called work management, as we get into Agile, this is very, very commonly uh, the area where we're looking at a lot of the uh, sprints, or we're looking at features or bugs or tasks that are going on. Yet at the same time, a project manager would be working at a sprint level or perhaps an epic, or you might be looking at user stories. And so there's this roll up and roll down conversation that's happening. Uh, for those of you that haven't seen uh, the new technology that Microsoft Project Team built, they put out something called a product called Planner. And uh, Planner is designed to be very much around the work management and then drilling down even into something called task management. Now, there will be other tools and things available, like, for example, if you haven't seen Wonderlist, uh, Microsoft's intent is that all tasks, regardless of where you're working, whether it's in Planner or a project or at an enterprise view or you're working in different places, get surfaced into something called task management. And Wonderlist is kind of the intent from an agile perspective that says, hey, look, high level, low level, doesn't matter, team foundation, server, visual studio, we can kind of surface those together. So we're going to see a little bit more in this area coming forward, but uh, very exciting uh, as you notice the barrier between uh, what is a task and then what does it roll up to is getting uh, smaller and smaller. 
High level conversation, a lot of people ask about Project Online or Project Enterprise, and I'm just going to make sure you guys understand that what I'm going to show today will work in both an enterprise version with Project Online and certainly if you're just in the desktop, Project Standard. Uh, in fact, I encourage you as you start looking at some of the templatization that I've done, if you'd like that, uh, send me an email. Send anyone that's an advisor con an email. Happy to share some of the templates that we use in Project around the Agile space. But the idea is that we have this space-time continuum, and as technology marches forward, you're going to find points in time, like example, in May of 2016, Microsoft said, hey, the bits in the online environment are stable enough, we're going to roll this down to on-premise. Well, that march is going to continue to go forward as you look at some of the functionality that's being planned for Microsoft product, both what's there today and also what's coming. So as we dig into Agile, I didn't want to do too much of a methodology conversation, but I want people to understand that, you know, I hear organizations say, we're Scrum, we're a Scrum organization. I'm thinking, okay, well, Scrum is one of the many Agile methodologies, and so there are different approaches. They all have strengths and weaknesses. In fact, I'm in the middle of writing a book on this right now, um, but I want to make sure I tie it back into practical approaches and using technology to help make that work. So whether it's lean development, crystal, rapid application development, or joint rapid application development, or test-driven development, extreme programming, you'll see lean as a, a commonality. Um, there's a lot of flavors that are the same. So when you think about an agile methodology, really what we get into is the conversation around doing iteration, right? We talk about complex adaptive systems or approaches that allow you to manage your work and your task management. So some of the benefits of Agile, and if for those of you that have used this or been involved in it, it can be a little weird, uh, but um, this is a very common and a very exciting environment where a lot of the Agile teams are very, uh, very much wedded to doing this. In fact, uh, technical resources and customers begin to really enjoy Agile. Uh, in terms of the flexibility of quickly getting to productive work or quickly producing value. The idea is that you want to deliver the highest value first, hyper-focus on getting something out the door, and while you're not spending a lot of time doing you know, deep requirements gathering, you still are in many cases, you're evolving your requirements, what your needs are against the overall goals and objectives. Um, my background, of course, was in construction, and I worked construction for the U.S. Navy, and that was uh, what we call CBs. So we're a combat construction unit, and uh, we go around and we build stuff, and we usually uh, go and blow it up and then rebuild it, and we'd work with different groups. But the common term we refer to it as Semper Gumby. Right, always flexible, and that's important that you have creativity, adaptability, and flexibility within both scheduling with Microsoft Project or any of the other systems that you have so you can get in, get out, and get back to work. Again, from a benefits perspective, you've got results, you could do more with less, you have kind of a lean approach, uh, and all of these do translate to different styles and different approaches inside of Microsoft Project or the scheduling tool that you may be using. Now, there are some dangers. While people like uh, Agile, there are definite dangers around using this. And I've been on some great projects where we had a wonder wonderful iterative Agile approach. I've also been on projects that have been horrifically messy in terms of people adhered to a process that really wasn't working and it didn't yield the value. And so you find that a lot of organizations will do these little um, detailed uh, working sessions that will break into doing an Agile component, but then what's happening is everyone, instead of looking at a portfolio perspective, are all reinventing the wheel. They're building the same thing. Um, in some cases, the iterations, you lose sight of what the overall prize are, and hence this is why Scrum Masters or you have people that are uh, basically experienced in helping to facilitate not only the business goal objectives, but also the customer and the tech, uh, tactical teams that are working directly in the Agile environment. Uh, of course, there's a loss of project program and portfolio visibility, and this is where Microsoft Project comes back in that says, look, um, whether you're going to use a connector to connect directly to, say, a JIRA, or you're going to connect directly to a team foundation server, the idea is that it does roll back into a project, a program, and we do have demand and capacity planning. It just means that the technical component of a project might have a series of iterations, and we want to be able to switch to views that can manage that. Again, not capturing all the metrics. Uh, if you look at some of the tools that are out there, they're not time-phased. So whether it's JIRA or TFS or you're looking at version 1 or Rally, a lot of the technical teams are saying, hey, this is what I've got done. This is what's remaining. 
but it isn't time phase, meaning it's simply at a task level. It's not stretched out over where we can see that earned value that says, are we actually using our time to get this work done? It's only points in time, and there isn't necessarily a snapshot or a trending report around that. Now, I could go on about uh, the benefits and dangers, but really at the end of the state is that we have developers who are kind of in the middle of uh, the client, the developer, the tester, the project manager, executive stakeholders who want to see a high-level roll-up, and inherently that everyone is coming directly at a technical team. So the goal of a good project manager is to help make sure that this is communicated and rolled up or rolled down, but that you aren't typing all the micro nits inside of the technology itself. Now I'm going to show a couple things here, and I'm going to talk about what's called the roadmap. I won't go into all of this because um, a year ago I actually spent uh, time explaining what the big picture roadmap is. Um, but what I will say is that uh, while the roadmap uh, kind of got put on the back burner, I will say that the roadmap a year ago is back on track, especially as we look at out-of-the-box reporting, uh, the ability to have native application integration, and of course agile front and center in terms of, of PPN investment. So imagine going to Microsoft Project, the desktop tool, or perhaps even going to the online environment and having a Kanban board where you can start kind of brainstorming activities and moving information around between sprints or between any of what we call the buckets that you have. Now Planner does this now, and uh, the screenshot that I'm showing you is a mock-up. This isn't actually live code. Uh, Microsoft would actually uh, come down here and shoot me if I was showing anything that was real or current uh, because it's not necessarily fully released. But this is a part of the roadmap picture that's out there that says, hey, this is exactly what we're thinking. And what's nice about this is as you begin planning around Agile is that we're talking about a database. Project isn't a waterfall tool. It's not a lean tool. It's not a waterfall tool. It is a relational database around time phase scheduling. So the way that we organize our group activities is something that you'll be able to manage. And if you haven't seen the planner product, which is designed directly for Office 365, to get in and use a Kanban board, put all the task and task management into uh, groups and teams, you're going to see a lot of the same flexibility. Well, that was built by the project team. So the idea of being able to take and manage this is really important from a perspective of looking at it. Now, let's jump into project. We're going to take this database approach, and we're going to look at uh, kind of the idea of an overall project. So a lot of you guys may be building schedules. You might have paths. You can see your critical path. You can see your baseline. And as you go through, you can progress your work activities and have red, yellow, green indicators coming up telling you how you're doing, <laughs> maybe even showcasing that if you don't get caught uh, back up, there's a pink slip for you, and you can have frowny faces, whether it's schedule, work, and cost. But a lot of times we get down to a section here, perhaps, that might be development. And you might have test. You know, build, test, deploy, and you might have a series of 30, 60, 90 percent design releases, or you might be working on a release schedule around some of the activities. And so at a high level, in many cases, project managers don't want to put all the sub-details. They might be breaking something directly out into a sprint. So what I put together is a template that just says, look, why don't we take the database and we're going to organize information in terms of sprints. Now, whether you want to do a sprint and you're going to put features or you're going to put sprint, you might put user stories, and under your user stories you might have features. It doesn't matter what label you tack on it, but the idea is that you have a hierarchy of things that roll up or roll in together. Uh, in fact, very commonly, an epic itself might be the project file. And the project file is something that you'll work with to say, OK, here's what we're managing. This is the entire epic. But this portion of this whole file may be embedded completely in a, a larger program, or maybe it's a subcomponent of a larger project. The idea, though, is that we deal with what we call the backlog. And the idea from a backlog perspective is that in terms of putting everything out there and everything on the table, you want to prioritize what produces the highest or lowest value. So in this case, in this uh, Agile template in Microsoft Project, you'll notice that I've got this column called Customer Need. And this, of course, is very important because in many cases, you are doing portfolio management, but you're doing it at a micro level that says, how do we prioritize what we work on? Now, that could be a number system, could be a rating scale, but the idea is that we want to prioritize elements, objects, functionality that goes together. 
Now, as you know, of course, a good project manager in many cases is looking at a schedule of duration, start and finishes, but I also like to get a level of effort. Now, what's hard about doing an agile project is that when you talk to a technical team, especially if you're in IT or development, in many cases, you're doing things that have never really been done before. And so the, hence the term story points. The idea is that you can go and say, how complex is this? And whether you want to use shirt sizes, shoe sizes. In fact, uh, Columbia Sportswear will use uh, things like their shoe size or shirt size. Or basically, you'll have uh, these uh, organizations that are in manufacturing uh, will have a certain label. But the idea is that you're sizing how complex it is. So somebody came to you and said, hey, listen, I need you to build a shed in the backyard. You go, huh, a shed. Well, I, I don't have any skill sets in building, but a shed can't be that hard. It's only going to be five feet wide and five feet high and five feet tall, and it's going to need some wood, and I probably can go online and figure that out. I don't think the complexity is that different. Whereas somebody might come and say, well, I need you to build a subdivision. And there's going to be 30 houses, and we have to do permitting, and we have to lobby the state to go ahead and get uh, permission to change the zonal boundaries. And suddenly you go, whoa, that complexity factor has gone off the charts. Well, the idea of story points is it allows your technical teams the ability to kind of weigh or put a weighting factor around either a task or a feature or a user story or whatever level of detail that makes sense. Now, in other presentations, I've shown you how you can actually go and connect, say, these activities directly out to, say, Team Foundation Server, so that another tool is where the developers might be working can roll down and break out the details, but have that pull back. But whether you're using a connection and you're pulling data in or out, or this is the level of planning that you're working from, it's helpful to understand, is it done, where's the state of this, having a lookup, and the ability to also plan what sprint it is. The rest falls into a good schedule, and I'm sure a lot of you have spent time working with that. But let me show you a couple things that you can do that. So by using just a few custom fields, I'm able to actually do some forecast planning to see, hey, listen, it looks like Sprint 1, looking pretty good here. Oh my, Sprint 2, 151 story points, right? That may not be quite accurate. And so you might be trying to weigh or balance when things will get done based upon their complexity factor. From a good scheduling perspective, I try not to disconnect some level of effort around how many hours that might be or the time period. But remember, a sprint is a time boxed period. And this is really important because a best practice will say what you want to do is lock down information around an activity. In fact, one of the things that comes up is I'll have people building these sprints and they'll say, well, you know, Tim, I can come in. And if I'm managing this, and I actually come out here and I just change the duration, it's possible for me to increase the overall amount of time of a task or an activity beyond the amount of time that that sprint will be. In fact, you notice here that I'm getting a note that says, hey, listen, you're going to create a scheduling conflict. And part of that is, is that whether you want to use a constraint or my favorite is just to come in and assign a deadline to the end date. So if I say, hey, this is a week-long sprint from Monday to Monday, 4-11, I may just want to have a visualization that says, when I come in here and I'm working on this back in April, let's go back here, I want to say, if it slips beyond that week, I need to know about it. Now you can see here I've got a deadline. And as the team is either timesheeting or progressing or telling you how many hours are remaining, where you're doing some sort of an update in planning, is that if for any reason, if I come in and I sweep in my duration column, and I'm just kind of progressing this, or I'm actually maybe even synchronizing this with the Team Foundation server, and somebody comes in and says, well, the remaining amount of time for this is not four days, it's going to be 16 days, and we hit Enter. Well, while I may hard code my end dates, uh, you certainly can turn that off. The other part is, is you want to know in a planning perspective if you're going to see if that might be slipping. So as I begin to organize in a hierarchy, almost like a, a work breakdown structure, I'm using the sprint to help plan. And I can drag, I can drop, and I can move my, act, my activities and calculations together to see whether I have enough time to do that work or not do that work. Now let me go ahead and uh, change this duration back to four days. We'll kind of rein that back in. And let's look at some of the things you can do once you have done a little bit of planning that says I've got effort, I might have work. But I also have the prioritization of customer need, story points, the state that something is, and then I can kind of create a report for around this. So if I go up to my View tab, 
I can come in here and I can actually apply burn down views and say, you know what, I want to actually apply a burn down filter. Or I want to actually change the overall visibility of a group to a burn down. And the idea is that I can group like items together here. In fact, for example, I might be saying, show me what's actually finished, what sprint it's in, and of course I have my duration and work, but maybe I'm looking at my story points so I can begin to learn whether I have the ability to pull things off the backlog or in future sprints I may not have enough time. Again, I might even be looking at something called a sprint retrospective where I'm just kind of organizing things by sprint. But the idea is that I can use the database to actually group and subgroup the activities of information based upon any of these columns. Now, I'll show you how to build these in just a moment. In fact, I recommend if you like this template, like I said, send me a note. Happy to share this. You don't have to recreate from scratch. But part of the things that AdvisorCon will be building out is we've got some additional reports that will tie into this that will showcase our story points and these numbers. But again, I can go in and out toggling things on. I can turn off and just clear the group. I can come right back to my schedule. In fact, if you embed or take these activities, in many cases you can create your own views or tables that say, hey, listen, this might be an agile uh, table that I want to quickly go to, but then again, I might be working on my overall tracking or a summary table. And I don't care to see all of these sprint activities or I want to collapse the details. Again, the idea is make the database work for you, hence using tables to help us plan, track, and manage our information. In fact, I'm even in pulling in cost uh, associated to an overall sprint. So I can look at both hours, I can look at story points and visualization. So let me show you how to build a couple of these, and then I'll uh, roll it out to how to build a group view. Uh, again, I know this is being recorded, so I encourage you guys definitely to jump out to our uh, YouTube channel as we kind of put these things out there. They really help you be a little bit more tactically uh, brilliant and a little bit more nimble in the use of that technology. So let's talk about the customer need, which essentially is a lookup table. Um, the state table, the sprint table, I usually also make these drop downs. I like people to pick from a list. How many sprints do we have or is it on the backlog? And the idea is I'm actually creating a commonality that I can sort, filter, and group these activities. So let me right click on this. I'm going to go to custom fields. And once I have that column header selected, it'll take me right to where that's at. And you notice here I've got something called lookup. So if you take any of the fields, I always recommend that you come in and you rename that to be what it is. In this case, I called it customer need. It's kind of hard to remember all the different fields that you may have. If I click on lookup, I can actually choose low, medium, low. And if I want to put in here, this is extra crispy, and that's going to be my new field. And I can choose a default value that says, hey, let's set the medium to default. You can just check the box. Pick whichever value, and that means as you add new activities across the board, you can actually see those. Again, that now means I can come in here, I can pick, here's my drop down, and I have a unique way to sort, filter, and group. Also, if for some reason you decide to throw a new feature on the backlog or you have something that you're working with, I'm going to say this is feature 26. And you'll notice the default value came right in. So make yourself uh, and make project do the work for you. So if you typically start with a priority and it's in the middle, you can strategize around that. You can actually come in and validate that. Again, some options to play with. Now, with custom fields, the same goes like, for example, story points. All I did here to go to custom fields is I took a number field because I do want this to roll up. I want to uh, put a burn down to show, hey, am I doing the work? Am I completing these activities? How many story points are remaining in a sprint? Or if I'm looking at a series of, of epics, I might want to look at an entire series of, hey, are we trying to bite off more than we can chew in all the features or functionality that we're working with? And by making that a number field, we can actually do those calculations against it versus a text field. Now finally, I went up here and I created a group here called burn down. And notice how it just basically groups the state column of what's started, what's not started, what's in progress, and then it subgroups each of these again based upon the sprint that they're in. So let's look at creating our own group. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to click on more groups. And in this case, I'm going to click on burn down, which is the one that I built. But I normally would actually go and just create a new group. In fact, I recommend don't edit your original groups. That's not a good practice because there's other views, tables, and filters that might be used in project natively. So always make a copy 
of something to use it. But let's take a look at burn down. I'm going to click on edit. And you can see here as you come in and says, hey, I'm going to group. Well, what field would you like to group by? And you can do it by status manager. You can do it by any of your custom fields. In fact, if you're dealing with an enterprise environment, you can actually group it from the enterprise fields as well, locally at a desktop level. A lot of times with the project online or project server, kind of the enterprise approach, is that we build one view, one filter, one custom field, and then anybody who connects inherits that automatically. So we put that in that enterprise global template. So I can say, hey, let's also group by a sprint. And I can choose the order, ascending, descending. And you'll find that you actually have the ability, especially even if you're putting in number fields. Like here, if I come in here and I go, hey, where is those story points? Well, here's my story point field. How do you want to group that? Well, I can come in here and define what the group intervals are. And it'll recognize, hey, listen, I can group on each value. I can do it as an interval of 100. So let's group all the 100 uh, task levels. How many points, uh, story points do we have together? All activities that fall under 100, then fall under 200. So if I look at using a number field versus a text field, watch this. I click on define group intervals. It says, hey, you can group on each value, or you can do characters. Project recognize whether it's a number, a text, a date field, and allows you to group things together, especially if you're dealing with dates. So if you want to say, show me a month in a grouping, we can do that here directly. So again, let me clear the story points out, but let me show you what I did here. As I came in, I picked these two fields as a parent and a subgroup. You can also come in and choose the type of color you want to see. You can change the font. You can even show set tasks in the summary or non-summary. You can basically basically pull things out of the entire hierarchy, meaning that if it's in summary task 32 and you've got an activity that's up in summary task 12, when it does grouping, you can actually pull things and lump them together. It might be training activities or maybe even a core resource. So in this case, let me just go ahead and uh, save it. Let me apply it. You can see right here is that I can still change my group I could modify those directly. Again, you can have that visualization. So from a planning perspective, I recommend the ability to use your custom fields, right? You can always clear these groups, go right back out there. You can filter for your IT activities versus the entire waterfall schedule. In many cases, you'll see this embedded activity nested within a, a subsection of your schedule. So you might have the high waterfall schedule, and then right down here, you might have your technically uh, technical activities all broken down together. Use your views and your filters. It's a great database to work from. OK, I know I've covered quite a few things uh, from an overall perspective. I'm going to kind of wrap up today here and just say, think of it this way. Project is not a waterfall tool. It's not an agile tool. It's a database. So use it like an Agile database. If there's fields or groupings, or if you have kind of a tailored uh, scrum or fall, or sometimes we call it Wagile approach, you too can also kind of set this up where you can get in, make your modifications, track the activities, but see where that information is. And again, it, the key is that filtering, grouping, and custom fields. That's really where you'll build it on. Uh, in many cases, we'll take this type of a template and embed it directly inside of the subsection. And again, you can also connect project directly to other technologies out there. Now, you may have to go get a connector for some of these, but in general, the idea is that you don't have to have all the details in your project schedule. You can roll them down into the tools that the technical teams are using and have the information roll back up. The key is the hierarchy that you want to work with. All right. Well, with that being said, uh, as you guys know, if you have questions, you can reach out to us anytime. Uh, we always love to hear your comments and feedback. And again, I encourage people, if they like the uh, Agile template that I used, send us an email or join our uh, webinar Wednesdays. We do this quite often. And again, this is some of the technologies that we work in. So in many cases, we might be dealing with something that might be a SharePoint list or connecting to another relational database. But again, it always supports our project program and portfolio management. Angie, let me turn this back over to you, but uh, again, thanks for the opportunity to showcase how to use project in an agile environment, and be excited for what's coming. There's some great things that you're going to see appearing in Project Pro and in the enterprise environment very soon. Thanks, Tim. That was a lot of useful information.
Now, I'd like to invite those interested in having an opportunity to explore some of the Microsoft technologies that you've seen demonstrated in our sessions, such as Microsoft Project, SharePoint, Visio, Power BI, or anything with Office 365. We would love to set you up with a free trial M demonstration for you and your team, so please feel free to reach out and we can get that set up for you. As I mentioned at the beginning of our time together, today's session does qualify for half of PDU. The only thing I need you to do is to fill out the short survey that will appear in your browser once I close this session. Our webinar Wednesdays are designed with you in mind and are largely made by you as each topic is based off your comments and input. So please give us your feedback and we will do our best to accommodate. Once I receive your survey input, you will receive an email from me on Friday with the PDU number. Also, today's session is recorded and will be uploaded to Advisacon's YouTube channel later today. If you haven't checked out our YouTube channel, I highly recommend it as it contains recordings from our previous sessions along with several additional tutorials and how-to videos which are very helpful. With that being said, I believe we have covered everything. If you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out directly to Tim, myself, or any of us here at Advisacon via website or by phone. We are here for you and we'd love to answer any questions you have. On behalf of myself, Tim, and the Advisicon team, we want to thank you for joining us and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone.